Lunch, as my colleagues will testify, is normally my absolute comfort zone. Uh, it's a rare field of professional expertise. Um, and unfortunately, this lunch is rather different, uh, what with the speech and everything. Um, but I can assure you it will be considerably shorter than what I would normally deem a proper lunch. <laughs> so I will get on with it. Um, this speech presents my agenda, uh, and I'm very, very grateful to the many council members, past presidents, and friends who have encouraged and contributed to it. I'd also like to acknowledge my debt to two wonderful men, both sadly now no longer with us, David Abbott and Winston Fletcher, without whose help and kindness and mentoring, I would certainly not be standing here today about to give this speech. It's a tremendous honor to be your president, and I'm keenly aware of the responsibility that comes with representing you, the membership, especially as my term coincides with the centenary of the IPA. I'm proud to say that I've worked in advertising for nearly 30 of those 100 years. I'm proud because I believe that advertising can be a noble profession. What we do is fundamentally good and of great value. It's good for businesses and the economy, good for consumers and society as a whole, and good for the people who make a living from it. I want my agenda to demonstrate and celebrate not just the economic, but also the societal benefits of advertising, the values as well as the value of what we do. In so doing, we will ensure the long-term future, our long-term future, and we will continue to attract the best talent into all our agencies. But, of course, outside this lovely room, there are plenty of people who are ready to attack advertising. Quote, advertising is objectionably consumerist, selfish, driven by commercial considerations which conflict with wider society considerations like family and decency. So said Peter Oborn, the journalist, recently at the Adweek Europe conference. I disagree with this assumption that commercial considerations will inevitably be at odds with decent society. Our values and our positive role in society matter now more than ever. Why do I say this? Two reasons. First, the financial crisis. Part of the fallout from the financial crisis is an ongoing discussion about how capitalism elevated one aspect of our human natures above all others, asserting that we are individuals out to maximize our material self-interest. And we in advertising obviously are the poster boys for this, making society more naturally, more materially focused, making people want things they neither need nor can afford. What people are now saying post-crash is we must recognize we are more than just consumers that we exist in relationships, that we are part of society and part of communities. We have values and ideals beyond our own material well-being. Reason two for the importance of our values and our wider role in society is the impact of technology. The ubiquity of the internet and the rise of social media have changed the landscape in which we operate. It's a cliche, but it's true. People know more about the brands they buy and the companies behind those brands. Choices are made on the basis of whether or not brands keep the promises they make, as has always been the case, but also now on the values that they have and their wider contribution to society. Because of all this, current business thinking demands that brands define a higher purpose beyond ROI or profitability. Three years ago, I was fortunate to hear John Mackey, the CEO of Whole Foods, speak at South by Southwest. I thoroughly recommend his book, Conscious Capitalism, which eloquently makes this higher purpose argument. Importantly, this is not hippie do-gooding. It's a business imperative. Brands that do this succeed. As Mackey's co-author, Professor Raj Sisodia, proves, showing that a basket of 28 conscious companies 
outperformed the S&P 500 over a period of 15 years by a factor of 10 and a half. We can play a pivotal role in this. We make promises on behalf of brands. Our purpose is to apply our collective creativity to helping brands articulate and fulfill their potential. But if we want to be trusted to do this, we need to be clear about our own values and our own contribution to society. This is crucially important when it comes to talent, the lifeblood of all of our businesses. If we communicate the positive contribution of the advertising industry, we will enhance our ability to attract the brightest and the best talent into it. The millennials, who are the future, are, uh, an, are a, an idealistic and values-driven bunch. 48% deliberately seek out employers whose corporate responsibility values reflect their own, according to PwC. And research by Global Tolerance showed that 61% of the millennial generation only want to work for organisations that do social good. To attract and retain the best talent, we have to tell our story in a way that inspires them, and we have to create careers and working environments that will nurture and fulfil them. And we have a fantastic story to tell. Nothing is more exciting than the power of creative thinking to transform businesses. So, what are we going to do? What's the practical agenda? My first commitment is that the IPA will draw up a code of conduct. For obvious reasons, I won't be following in Ian's footsteps on the acronym front in relation to this. You will get that. Um, we will codify the best practices that already exist amongst our members. We will invite people from outside to participate. This is normal practice for a professional trade body. The process of developing the code will encourage lively debate and a positive discussion about how we ensure the highest standards within our industry. Committing to fulfilling our obligations to all of our stakeholders will also raise the bar for how those stakeholders, and I'm thinking particularly about clients here, treat us. So let's take one very small but I think um, significant example. If we are prepared to undertake to pay our suppliers within a reasonable period of time, say 60 days, surely our clients should be able to make the same undertaking to us. Earlier, I said we were good for clients in the economy, good for consumers in society, and good for our people. So let's take those three goods in turn. First of all, good for our clients and the economy. We should do more to broadcast what an important, digitally-led part of the UK's economy we are. We're a huge and growing employer and a leader within the creative industries. Advertising underpins 100 billion pounds of UK GDP and we support 550,000 jobs. The IPA Effectiveness Awards are an international benchmark for making the case for the economic contribution of advertising. We will create a new Effectiveness Award recognizing commercial campaigns that have demonstrably added societal as well as economic value. Values uh, and, and also shown the virtuous link between those two things. So I'm thinking of uh, campaigns like Always Like a Girl, Barclays Life Skill, or Dove's Campaign for Real Beauty. As part of the client agenda, we will host a series of events that about brands' higher purposes. We'll look at how all of the diverse agencies in membership have applied thinking and creativity to unlocking those brand purposes. In many cases, the outputs, the outputs will be far removed from what we have traditionally seen as advertising. The second good, good for consumers and society. Never before have we known as much about consumer behavior, nor had as many powerful media tools at our disposal. With this comes great responsibility. I would like to see us demonstrate that we are taking this responsibility seriously and that we are ensuring that our clients do too. At the Lead Summit in January, Richard Eyre said that the old argument that if something is legal to sell, we should advertise it, was no longer good enough. 
it's also no longer good enough for us to say that we merely reflect society. We should set ourselves a higher goal and realise a more progressive ambition. To this end, we will explore five key topics relating to advertising's role in society, and the outputs will inform the code of conduct. One, the depiction of women and the subject of diversity in general in advertising. Two, the use of big data and the implications for privacy. Three, the rise of content, so-called native advertising, and the blurring of the lines between marketing and editorial. Four, the cultural contribution of advertising as one of the creative industries. And five, the perception and reputation of the advertising industry and its practitioners. The final good, good for our people. We will continue the excellent work that's been done to professionalise the workforce. Until now, the IPA has been mainly a corporate membership body, but we will encourage personal membership through a qualifications-based award system. This year, 153 people will qualify for MIPA status, and we want personal membership to be seen as a vital designation of professional expertise. I am delighted to announce today that the IPA is working towards achieving chartered status, and we hope that this landmark will be achieved before the centenary, thus buffing Paul Baines Fair's knighthood credentials. <laughs> the IPA has always promoted diversity and gender equality in advertising, and progress has been made, but there's still a long way to go. The percentage of the IPA employed base coming from the black and minority ethnic communities has steadily increased over time. But at 13%, we still don't reflect the composition of the nation as a whole. And while the gender split overall is neutral, women still only account for 25% of those at the highest level of seniority. And that percentage is way lower in the creative roles. This needs to change, and the pace of change needs to be upped. Change will only come if we are more transparent about how we are doing. So in partnership with Campaign, we will ask member agencies to contribute to a league table to be published annually, which will list the gender splits by department and seniority, as well as showing the percentage of black and ethnic minority employees in each agency. Again, this is not a nice to do, it's a necessity if we want to remain relevant to our clients, to society and to the people we want to attract into the business. Under Paul's direction, the IPA has developed a long-term strategy based on three core pillars of activity. One, what agencies do, the creativity, media and effectiveness pillar. Two, how agencies make their money, the commercial pillar, and three, who they need to do it well, the talent pillar. This agenda will inform and enhance the IPA's work across all three of these areas. It also aligns with the Advertising Association's responsibility agenda. We should be proud of what we do and of the contribution we make. I want us to be positive about the overall impact of the advertising industry and for us to show that we take our responsibilities seriously. Bill Burnback wrote, all of us who professionally use the mass media are the shapers of society. We can vulgarize that society, we can brutalize it, or we can help lift it onto a higher level. Over the next two years, we will reassert and secure for the future advertising's role as a culturally, socially and economically enriching force for good. I believe that making the bold statement, we are here for good, is a timely and fitting way for us to mark the start of the IPA's second century. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Tom. I'd like to vote for you. Yes. Um, 
It's the best speech I've ever heard in weeks. Um, <laughs> truly inspirational, I think very contemporary, and uh, I think from the response we got from the room, uh, something that's really chimed with the audience. So thank you once again. Thank you.